Hey, so I'm here with uh, Adrian Crook. Uh, thanks for being with me, Adrian. Uh, so basically, you're the author of the popular blog, Five Kids, One Condo. Uh, so for anyone that's watching that maybe doesn't know you or doesn't know your story, can you kind of elaborate a little bit further? Yeah, uh, obviously I have five kids in one condo. <laughs> uh, so the five of us, well, the six of us, we live in a downtown Vancouver condo in a neighborhood called Yale Town. We're in it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on the 29th floor. Some nice views here. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. It's, uh, I obviously cleaned it. Yeah. <laughs> Just for today. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, but basically we do it for a whole bunch of reasons. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, people think we're doing it uh, just because we have to, but mm -hmm. we love living in downtown Vancouver. And uh, we have two bedrooms and a den, and, mm -hmm. and that's how the kids are sort of set up and I think, pretty well. I think everyone wants to know, how many square feet is this? You know? 1,053. And it's, there's no, a... There's a little deck as well that I yeah. keep locked most of the time so the kids can't, you know, jump over the edge or anything crazy like that. Okay, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, how long have you been running the blog now? Uh, I think it's only been like a couple years, yeah. And I started doing that mostly because this, in North America, this is somewhat of a unique situation, yeah. you know, yeah. put it in like sort of high density uh, urban family living. It, the rest of the world, it's not unique at yeah. all. Um, so. It was my way of sort of advocating for what I believe is like a more sustainable, mm -hmm. uh, healthy overall uh, lifestyle for you know kids and adults alike. Yeah, I feel like you're kind of like the role model for. I mean, it is. I don't know. You can call it a sad reality or whatever, but I think like ultimately where we're at now, the future of Vancouver yeah. is condo living. It is like exactly. it is attached housing, right? Yeah, and I mean, it's we are in our little Vancouver bubble here, but mm -hmm. when you poke your head up and look at San Francisco, Boston, New York, oh, uh, totally. Toronto, go anywhere, and that, that they're all facing the same issues we're facing here, and Vancouver's got some of the lowest median income for millennials in the country, so, you know, I, we all want those situations to improve, but they're, are they ever going to improve to the point where we're all going to be out there buying single-family homes again? <laughs> Probably yeah, not. Yeah, you know, even if we're sitting around wishing for the market to crash, which, you know, we've all been thinking it yeah. might, uh, will it ever crash, quote-unquote, to the point where all of a sudden you can go buy a house for $500,000? Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah. like, the reality is that Vancouver, there's just such a limited land supply, so, I mean... Unless you're really willing to go to Abbotsford and Langley, even then prices are you know jumping Creeping up close up. to a million, right? So. Yeah, and then just on a larger scale, like from a climate perspective, you know, from an environmental impact, carbon footprint perspective, like our hydro bill is like thirty or forty bucks a month here for yeah. a family of six. You know, that's crazy. <laughs> it costs the city about half to service our unit as it does like a, a house in terms of you know police and fire and garbage mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. So there are a lot of incentives uh, from an environmental perspective even to live this way. So yeah, why exactly then downtown Vancouver? I mean, like I think you're going like again against conventional wisdom of like. You know the nice house, the white picket fence, but here we are, and we're basically in Yale Town here, yeah. uh, which is probably the busiest part of downtown. Um, why did you choose it? Why did I choose Yale Town or here? Yeah. Uh, well, I lived in Mexico for a little bit just okay. shortly before relocating back here. I lived in Playa del Carmen for about oh, nice. three years. Yeah, I mean, it's really great. If, you know, it's, I sort of liken it to eating chocolate cake. That's for a huge, meal every huge day. change from back here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, but I mean, culturally, it's. It was very much a resort town, and you know I know that's what people sort of uh, deride Vancouver for trending towards mm -hmm. is you know it's sort of a resort town, but it is not. There, there is Do no, you see Vancouver heading that direction? I or? don't as much uh, as others like to sort of you know predict because yeah. we have the community centers. My kids are at two different community centers today, okay. as a matter of fact, yeah. doing their day camps. Uh, we have the libraries, we have concerts. You know, I've lived in an actual resort town before, Playa del Carmen, and. Okay. Those things didn't exist, and that's what drove me back to Vancouver, is that proximity of all these cultural amenities uh, that we can just walk to. Yeah. Uh, and, in fact, visit several on the same day, you know, whether it's like the fee free uh, uh, family Sundays at the, at the art gallery or just a, a reading circle at the library or a kid's concert in David Lamb Park. Yeah. There's it's so, many so much, so much to do, right? Yeah, and we take that for granted, I think. So how do you uh, how do you manage like the kids and stuff like the situation you know like five of them so like in two bedrooms like how do you like I mean do you plan it out in terms of like when they're growing up and stuff I think that's something people want to yeah. know right like I mean obviously like the bunk bed situation now is is awesome like every kid growing up wants yeah, to have yeah. a bunk bed yeah. so like what happens like where do you foresee it 
in the coming years as they start to grow up like and the, and the space and that sort of thing yeah for sure and this this is a question i get a lot on the blog and actually it's more of a statement i get mm -hmm. you know the odd hater on the blog <laughs> <laughs> always, there's always yeah. oh for hate. sure and in newspaper articles it's yeah. even worse it's just all haters oh, in the God. comments you know never yeah. read the comments yeah. <laughs> oh, <I know. laughs> but uh but, like i think the number one thing they say is uh is well just wait till they're teenagers as if you know somehow this won't work when they're mm -hmm. teenagers and you know everyone will all of a sudden need it their own bedroom when they're a teenager and i'm never going to live in a house that has six bedrooms or a condo that has six bedrooms so this is the situation and and the funny thing is i've met a lot of people through my blog in you know mm -hmm. north america and elsewhere that have raised kids right from you know infancy all the way through to adulthood four or five kids at a time in, you know, whether it's in Chicago or New York, yeah. in situations exactly like this. So I think it's just people are not used to, uh, there's sort of that it's conventional like, wisdom. Yeah, that exactly. You're just like, oh, I have my second kid and now my fun time is over downtown. I've yeah. got to move up. I mean, I did the yeah. same thing. Like, yeah. After, when I was living in a you know, a condo in Cole Harbor with my ex-wife and okay. we had our second kid and it's like time to buy the house on Grand yeah. Boulevard in North Van and yeah. you don't even really think about it. It's just you think that is the natural progression of things. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I know that uh, you rent this place obviously, which yeah. you know, for a lot of people it makes a lot of sense, especially in this market. Mm -hmm. um, what is there a certain reasoning behind renting? Uh, like, do you ever fear the rent eviction? Yeah, okay. so. I love talking about this because I think generally as people were really crappy at math. Can I say crappy on this? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, good. <laughs> so far, we're... Yeah. yeah. So, no like, sensors here. That's right. I mean, we live downtown and people always say, well, that's really expensive. I, mean, I could never live downtown. I live out yeah. on Maple Ridge. And it's like, okay, well, that's great. But you also run two cars and yeah. you know, yeah. every housing choice is also a transportation choice. And when mm -hmm. you load up all those costs, your cost of living is actually higher than mine because I don't need totally. all those things. Yeah, so when it comes to renting, I do the same kind of number crunching. My rent here, and I've shared this everywhere from city council to blog posts and everything, so it's not a secret, is yeah. $2,200 a yeah. month. I have a bit of a deal, like, well, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> we had this discussion <laughs> before we yeah, started. Yeah, it's a good deal. You know, definitely <laughs> if I get rent evicted, it's three grand, it's 3500 it's something like that. But yeah. I've had a nice run of it now, so it all comes out in the wash. Mm -hmm. But if I were to buy this place, and this, you know, may run counter to sort of real estate wisdom, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. I hope it don't offend no, you. No, we're, <laughs> we're open to all sorts of ideas here, and like That's I said, I'm not exactly. like... To pro 100% buying and you know and owning. I think, like yeah. I said, for a lot of people, renting does make sense. So yeah. So I mean, I'm self-employed. I'm a single dad. So I have to be careful with my cash flow. I mm -hmm. don't have that you know every two weeks steady paycheck coming in that yeah. I can just build my whole life around. Um, so when I look uh, at my costs, I look at you know carrying the lowest fixed monthly costs I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And renting right now is it because if I bought this place. And this place would probably list for 900 or a million. Yeah, it'd be probably about a million, a thousand square so foot. So I put 10% like down on a million and carry a $900,000 mortgage yeah. and be servicing that at $4,500 a month plus $500 of a strata fee. Mm -hmm. So now I'm paying $5,000 a month for housing on top of any special levies or yeah. improvements I want to make to the exactly. place. Exactly. I think, yeah, I, so I think like obviously the counter argument to that is that, oh, well, you're not building like long term That's wealth. Right. Yeah. However, I mean. That's right. If you can realistically take some of that savings yeah, and put exactly. it, if you know, if you're smart with your money, you can put it somewhere else, then it does make sense. Yeah, and you know, but I mean, that is a that is a big if. Some mm -hmm. of us do it, some of us don't yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, and for some of us, it's, it's the difference between being able to live in a city we love and not at all. Like, mm -hmm. You know, renting is the only thing that allows you to live in a city you love. Like yes, yeah. and that's where I think a lot of the new development that we've had over the years has been really focused on sort of market condos. And we need to get a better mix of uh, purpose-built rental in there so that you know families can afford to stay in vancouver because a three-bedroom unit in a brand new condo yeah. downtown is a million and a half dollars yeah oh yeah that's at least not yeah. affordable for families what do you what do you th what's your take on like on the supply side and kind of what do you think that vancouver needs to start implementing because mm -hmm. i know that you're a huge proponent of that yeah so me and, and several others that have been involved on at sort of a council level on uh, lobbying for increased housing. I've started a little group called uh, Abundant Housing Vancouver, and that's okay. just abundanthousingvancouver.com. And our job is literally just to uh, volunteer, advocate for more housing mm -hmm. uh, for of all types for everyone. And so that includes you know market condos, uh, social housing, uh, 
co-ops as difficult and as that is yeah. a purpose-built rental yeah. um, because we need all that types of housing across the spectrum. Um, supply is a problem, but it's one problem. Yeah, uh, it's not the problem. And I think like a lot of people are advocating for for more two and three bedrooms. But I think ultimately the two and three bedrooms, like you mentioned, yeah. and I know that are being built, a uh, two bedroom, you know, can start from 1.3, yeah. over a million, right? So yeah. it's a nice thought. And if our, you know, our price to rent ratios were to hold where they are even today, I mean, it'd be great if we could go back to where they were a few years ago, mm -hmm. then maybe the person buying that million and a half, three bedroom is going to turn around and rent it out for $3,000 yeah. a month. I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't see that. I, and I love what the city's doing in terms of increasing that proportion mm -hmm. of two and three bedrooms up to, I think, 35% now. Uh, but in terms of new condo development, it, uh, it doesn't, and right downtown necessarily, it doesn't really help the affordability issue. Yeah, and I know there seems to be like a lot of pushback from, you know, local citizens that have like the detached house. I know that yep. you're, so you're at one of the meetings there and is mm -hmm. East Van. Tell yeah, me like a little bit yeah. what, what the deal is there. Yeah, that was a purpose-built rental development with 110 units in it that was at 18th and Commercial, and that fortunately got approved. Um, but when we went to the council meeting, it was still very much in play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was where we first sort of saw a, a, a rise in the number of sort of four. You know, yeah. The, the, I guess it's sort of colloquially called the YIMBYs, although I don't really like the term because it's kind of... What do they call adversarial, it? Adversarial YIMBYs, like, yes, in my backyard. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure out that one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yes in my yeah. but no, there is, there's, I mean, that level of resistance on a neighborhood level to sort of spot rezoning is nothing unique to Vancouver. I yeah. I mean, that's, everybody's got... Uh, a very sort of protectionist attitude about you know where they live and that's justified um, so when we're looking into what projects we want to support it, obviously it has to make contextual sense as well so you wouldn't you know I'm not sure I would necessarily personally support just dropping some giant market condo development in the middle of the downtown east side mm -hmm. for instance so okay uh, that's good so I guess like I think yeah I think part of the issue with the pushback is that these residents like Everybody wants affordability, but nobody wants to change the neighborhoods. And ultimately, we have a supply issue here. So, yeah. I mean, there's got to be some some give, some leeway. Well, and that's the thing. Like, people point to the European model of row houses, for instance. And mm -hmm. even in that very council meeting I attended, uh, one of the against presenters had a sort of presentation that showed sort of European row houses. You know, why can't we do this? I guess he meant on that particular lot, I would yeah. suppose. But, I mean, the density... It doesn't even compare. You know, yeah. you're going to put like ten or twenty road houses there, and as opposed to 110 purpose-built rental yeah, units. Yeah. So unless you're converting all of Commercial Drive to road then houses, then that's the only way it's going to make it a real impact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And people talk about you know, well, the zoning's already there for laneway houses. Well, just try to get laneway houses built. Uh, you know, it's it's very difficult. The permitting process takes a long time, and there's not there aren't enough people willing to put a laneway house in the back yeah. of their two million dollar property. Hmm. So. That's not enough to, you know, it's a part of the supply issue, but it won't solve it alone. We do yeah. need dense development like what, we're, what, what we've had for decades and what yeah. we need more of. And I think that you're a really good role model proving that, you know, it can work and that it does work and that families can live in condos. And like you, like you said, it's, it's norm in, in a lot of different parts of the world, right? Yeah. Well, it's not like my kids are little bonsai trees. I've somehow shrunk them to fit in here. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I think the only variable is... Uh, you know, people's kids are all the same size, <laughs> relatively speaking. People's junk yeah. is what varies. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and if you're willing to have not a lot of junk, yeah. which ultimately makes for a much less complex and, and straightforward which, life. Yeah, I know that's what you're all about. It's like, yeah. I know, so you have, what, is it one car and then... No car. No car. No. I thought you had a van. No, I sold that back in the fall. Okay, so now it is a car sharing and stuff? Yeah, so I'm a like member if you of, have to. I'm a member of all four car shares. Okay. Uh, Moto is my preferred car share just because it's seems to work out best, yeah. and, you know, minivans for kids and stuff like that. Uh, and, but I don't, you know, it's funny, since getting rid of the car, I already had car share memberships prior to getting rid of the car. Uh, and I actually, when I budgeted, hypothetically, like if I got rid of the car, I'm obviously going to use car shares more. Yeah. What I found is I use car shares less than when I had a car. Wow. Because I'm just not in that mindset of driving. Mentally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, I'll just walk or I'll bike. Just walk. Yeah, or bike. And then you've got Moby coming online, the bike sharing yeah. program. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask yeah. you, actually. It's a good leeway. What, like, so do you bike a lot? I do bike uh, as 
like I bike probably more for a simple transportation than I do recreation, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, okay. So then I'll, I'll go to like Ride Cycle Club and do spin class. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and just like sweat profusely. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that'll be my sort of recreational bike. And, yeah. And then I'll take the kids and we'll bike down to English Bay because that's the best way to transport all the picnic blankets. Yeah, and nice. <laughs> so, yeah, like I think, you know, the biking I do, if I need to get to like five meetings in uh, a really short amount of time. Yeah. The bike, there's no faster way to get around downtown than a bike. So are you like a huge proponent of like the, all the like additional bike lanes coming in? Is that something that yeah, you're trying I to Yeah, I am. Do? I am. And I mean, there's another thing. If you look at Commercial Drive and their mm -hmm. Business Improvement Association is resisting putting a bike lane down commercial. I think it's, yeah, I think it really just comes down to like old school thinking. And I don't know so if that's like just like me being a millennial, but like the conversations that I've had, it's just like like all like the young people are like good like they're good with living in a condo and they're like yeah. they understand like cars and driving and long commutes like just doesn't really make sense no exactly why and the funny thing is like there's this whole maxim and i know you working in the industry you've mm -hmm. heard this one before about like uh drive till you can afford yeah you know so then oh, they drive yeah, yeah. until they can afford a place mm -hmm. and then they get the two cars so they can drive to the high paying job back downtown yeah but like take the pay cut and either live where you work out there mm -hmm. or you know Live because downtown. the commute alone, I mean, ultimately, yeah. like, time is money. Yeah, but people so. never, fact, this is another math issue that people have, they never value their own time at anything. Mm -hmm. But even if you just valued, like, what you pay for a car, which, you know, is anywhere between eight to $12,000 yeah. of after-tax income yeah. every year. That's a lot of money. Like, that's a huge <laughs> amount of money. Yeah. And, you know, if you didn't have to earn that, then you could take a lower-paying job and have a better quality of life. Jeez. Yeah, no, I agree totally. I know you agree. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> do you? Uh, what do you think about the the Moby? Was it Moby Bike Share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it took a while for the city to engineer because right. they went through another provider first, and there's still the mandatory helmet sort of yeah. rule, which I hope gets scrapped. The number one uh, thing that sort of uh, causes head injuries while cycling is, is crappy infrastructure. Not mm -hmm. to reuse the word crappy in the same interview, but <laughs> it has nothing to do, there's no correlation between helmet use and, and bike injuries at all, okay. if you look sort of among, sort of, you know, like in a national survey. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting better with the infrastructure, um, you know, even as we sit, like we're sort of encircled now by bike lanes, like yeah. new ones on Beatty and uh, yeah, Smythe yeah, and that. Nelson and Canby. So it's got, rid of, uh, got rid of a bunch of parking for yeah, sixty percent, sixty percent of on street parking on BD one away. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. I take that route all the time. Yeah, um, and the changes, but I mean, that now you've got like instead of having cars up in front of your coffee shop, you've got bikes and mm -hmm. bike racks and bike share. It's I very mean, like European esque. Yeah, which I think they have a pretty good lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people always point to that as yeah. being the standard. Yeah, know? exactly. So I think that's just like an adjustment change. Do you think that the the bike share is going to work? Because I think the counter argument is that like yeah. nine months of the year it's raining, and it's like, well, yeah, yeah. do people want to? There are so there? many <laughs> like they, I think somebody I at some point put out a blog post of all the the sort of the counter arguments to biking. And, yeah, you know, the weather one is such a, like <laughs> it's got to be in the top three. Yeah. But if you look at, you know, nations, uh, cities like Amsterdam, Copenhagen, let's say, where we always point to them as the examples of great cycling cities. Yeah. And you look at, you know, in the dead of winter, it's snowing and how much biking is still going on in those cities. It's, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but those, you know, those bike racks are still packed and the streets are still packed with cyclists. If the infrastructure is there and people use that as their primary mode of transportation, that's when the culture changes but if you're constantly there's a great saying about like you can't judge the need for a bridge by seeing how many people are swimming across a river you know like yeah. if it's not there people won't use yeah, it yeah that's true so, I think that, that like i said the mentality could change once it's actually brought in well i think yeah. it's already started to phase in now it has yeah and it, you know there's there's protected bike lanes which is really the only type of bike lane there should be shared yeah. or you know, oh yeah, that's a disaster. Painted, like, I think that's useless. what people get like all upset about, like the bikers and stuff. Oh yeah. I think it's ultimately because there isn't really like the bike lanes no, are insane. fine. Yeah. yeah, it's insane. I mean, if we have the money to build a road and build a sidewalk, we can also build a bike lane. Yeah. yeah. This is just one of these lagging sort of mentalities. And I, think, I think, you know like a lot of people are frustrated. What is it, the Burrard Street Bridge? And they... Oh yeah. Well, I mean, people did, they're doing some whatever. Yeah. Whatever. But yeah. there's that point gray upset over expanding the sidewalk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That's hilarious. hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get towards kind of wrapping it up. I mean, obviously, like, I think you're a pretty good visionary for Vancouver and obviously, like, a pretty good role model for, I think, what the future holds for Vancouver and how to actually live in it. Yeah. So, I mean, what would you like to see, like, in Vancouver? I mean, what do you think that 
that you, they need to start implementing and that sort of thing. Yeah, well my big thing, and this is just my personal bias, mm -hmm. but I do believe it's what we need is more purpose-built rental and I know, again, that flies in the face of yeah. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> But there are like... I agree though, right? Because there, yeah. there needs to be options and like yeah. I said, for a lot of people, buying just doesn't make sense. For a lot of people, yeah. renting makes sense and like yeah. I'm not opposed to that. Um, and I mean, there are other things as well, like I, I have a, I'm of two minds about services like Airbnb. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of data out there that supports either sort of position on it. Personally, I would I want to touch on your opinion actually. Yeah, no, I would, I would personally love to be able to air, like let's say I own this place. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe this might be a realm in which it would make sense for me to own this place if I could Airbnb it half the time or a third of the time. Uh, because as it is, I have my kids half the time. So I'm, I'm divorced, so I have my kids, you know, one week or two week on, you know, one week or two week off, whatever. Okay. So half the time I'm in here alone, mm -hmm. you know, with like a thousand square feet. Yeah. And yeah. I often travel. And so I could easily rent it out, I could easily rent it out for yeah. probably like three, three fifty a night. And that kind of money, even a week a month, yeah, is a serious offset. That's like two k a month offset yeah. to my cost. So, in that sense, if we could come up with a regulatory scheme that allowed uh, people who lived in their unit to be able to to gain that kind of um, incremental income, mm -hmm. then I'd support that. The problem is how Airbnb is currently being operated in a yeah. lot of places is it's just cannibalizing the. The rental market. Yeah, I think that's true. Like I can see like the effects it's having for people that are trying to rent long term because it's taking up a lot of the supply. Yeah. But I think it's also like it just depends where you're coming from because like the same people will make that argument and then they'll travel to say Whistler or whatever. Yeah, and get an Airbnb. Airbnb. They'll go and get an Airbnb exactly. or they travel to Europe. They'll get an Airbnb. Oh, I've done the same thing. I've New York, thing. whatever, right? Yeah. And so it's just like okay, well, you're it's a, a bit of a hypocrite. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, no I, I totally agree. I, I just I think we're sort of playing catch up. This is mm -hmm. you see this all the time, like technology outpacing. Oh yeah, like, innovation. Like I don't think innovation really cares about anyone's feelings. Well, and, like Uber will just yeah. stomp all over everyone yeah. until they're forced legally to do something otherwise. Exactly, and I think that I feel like it's grown too big now to try and like pull it back. But yeah, yeah. you obviously need to work with Airbnb to make sure that you know it makes sense something has to change yeah because yeah. I mean even anecdotally and I hate anecdotal evidence because it's not evidence at all but you know there have been several suites in this building that have gone to Airbnb and then there's this process about trying to like you know the, the suite right beside me was Airbnb for a long time and now it's a very lovely older grandmother in a long-term <laughs> rental situation yeah, because yeah. I guess the owner got fined enough that yeah you know he was like okay I'll, I'll change what I'm <laughs> yeah. doing with this but uh, but in the current situation, the, those have to be reported to the city by someone, so the city can't proactively investigate Airbnb listings. Yeah. Uh, so a lot has to change, and I know um, Councillor Meggs is actually leading up that sort of Airbnb, um, I don't know what you want to call it, like study. I yeah. Guess. So hopefully that would be interesting. Comes to that. Yeah. Um, any kind of last words for, I guess, families with kids that are kind of gri gripping with the fact that they're going to have to live in a condo, like <laughs> any, any, condo. any kind of suggestions. I mean, like, like I said, like I'm good with it. Like yeah. I've come to the reality that, you know, one day, like if I have a family or whatever, like that's just kind of the reality. If you want to stay in Vancouver, I mean, I'm yeah. not one that wants to travel out to Langley or Abbotsford. Uh, <laughs> no offense. <Langley> or <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, any kind of lot like, uh, yeah. suggestions or words of advice. Oh, almost too many lists. Obviously five kids, one condo is where I put a lot of that advice but I think the best thing to do is to really do a thorough accounting of your life and where you're spending your time and that's my thrill, <laughs> flushing the toilet <laughs> um, yeah because I think you'll be surprised like yeah. you'll be surprised what you're actually paying to sustain a life that you think is cheaper or mm -hmm. that you're getting more out of and if you start valuing your time as part of that equation you'll realize that all that time you spend in a car is not contributing yeah. to your happiness and I can pop out for an hour and go to a social everything's right at your doorstep right here yeah. And I just find the opportunity cost is also another thing that people don't measure when they move far out. So when you get home to your place in Langley and there's like a, you know, a, let's say a work mixer back downtown that might be good for your career, yeah. you're not going back downtown. Yeah. And then you know, you, maybe you would have met someone that would have given you your next job there. Mm -hmm. And I, that has happened so many times, even in the three years that I've been living back downtown, that type of serendipitous Hey, I just went out for an hour and we, you know, as a result, got a big contract. Right? Yeah, I think that's, that's you know, totally like the urban. It is. Yeah. But I mean, it's, 
I think everyone likes opportunity and everyone wants mm -hmm. to advance and be connected and the best place to do that is in a high density urban center. Yeah. It's not in a pasture. Oh, I think that's part of the reason why people go to New York, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and which is a place I would totally live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where can where can people find more about you, uh, more about your story? Yeah, so five kids one condo, like number five kids number one condo dot com, uh, is my blog. It's really just a passion project. Yeah. I think I've earned about fifty bucks in Google AdSense nice. revenue off that. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, like two years. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's really just where I sort of pour my heart out about uh, what I sort of believe in and, you know, hopefully it doesn't come across too ranty. And then AbundantHousingVancouver.com is uh, a small group of us that have started to sort of lobby effectively for, for change at the city and provincial and federal levels whenever we get the opportunity in terms of increasing Vancouver's housing supply. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Adrian. Thanks awesome. for being here. My Appreciate pleasure, it. Steve. Thanks a All lot. Right. Thanks a lot. Right on.